Well, I feel unaccomplished. Um, <laughs> but you have your nails done, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most importantly. Um, so, okay, so you had a, a killer 2015. You've had some hits this year as well, of course. What is the, the, the where does this come from? Is it, is it luck? I mean, it's such a fickle business to an outsider, at least. So how did you do it? <laughs> Well, 2015 was definitely a banner year for Universal, um, but it was it was sort of made on the back of a couple of years actually, where we were rebuilding the studio, rega regaining some momentum. We'd actually gone through a fairly dark period of about five years, where the business model changed quite dramatically. Home video, um, still a multi-billion-dollar business, but it, it sort of it had been supporting the film slate for so long, and then consumer habits changed almost overnight, and so the business model changed pretty rapidly. So budgets, the number of movies, things like that, had to be reevaluated re and reconsidered. And um, you know, for a long time, we faltered uh, for, for a number of different reasons. And so you know, we, we really took, we had to take a big step back. Um, most of the major studios have IP, intellectual property, that they use to uh, you know, base their franchises upon. Mm -hmm. And Universal traditionally does not have that IP. And so we really had to take a look at what was our core competency. What did we do well as a production company, as a, as a marketing company, and as a worldwide global distribution organization? And you know, a lot of that came down to the people. It comes down to taste a lot of the time, you know, and, and how do we cater for our audience. And so we redefined what a franchise means to Universal. It could mean anything from Jurassic World or Fast and Furious, all the way down to um, starting a micro-budget horror uh, business mm -hmm. with a, a producer called Jason Blum. And we've had uh, the, the third installment of The Purge out this year, and it's actually one of the only sequels that has done better than its predecessor. And horror movies are actually incredibly profitable, They, right? they are, because we, and we make our horror movies of $5 million. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then they go out and you know gross they can gross anything to up to just as a comparison a, a budget typically for a Fast and Furious that's about that? two hundred and fifty million dollars okay. so, so it is it's the it's the it's the craft services for one day <laughs> on a Fast and Furious movie um, so we we're able to make these movies uh, we got into the animation business and and, and as, as well with Illumination our company and produced films like uh, the Minions film and this year Secret Life of Pets. Also, a business model where we make our films for quite less than some of our competitors, and so the, the margin on those films were, was really good. So, in answer to your question, we sort of looked at our product line, looked at our core competency, looked at the business rationale for each one of our films, made sure that it was a lot more rational than what we had. We were really looking at the reality of the business, and I think that, and a little bit of luck, uh -huh. and some good headwinds, and. Yeah, we ended up in 2015. Another, another big shift and trend in uh, the entertainment business is uh, a, a huge focus and influx of money from China. Um, do you see the market there? I mean, obviously, it's, it's a huge market. It's overtaking us uh, in terms of the theater market, at least. Mm -hmm. um, do you see it as an opportunity? I know you've got some co-financing deals also, or a threat, or both, because they're obviously you know, Chinese production companies and other companies are, are pouring a lot of money into Hollywood, but they're also building their own Hollywood locally. Absolutely. <clears throat> no, China's ex it, it very important to the movie industry today. I think any emerging market is important where, as you say, you know, the number of movie theaters and film goers that, um, that uh, has increased in China year over year, the numbers are extraordinary, and so we're seeing that reflected in the box office. So, you know, five years ago, we didn't have any boots on the ground in China. We were um, distributing our films there, the ones that were distributed there through a third party. And we now have our own distribution, marketing organization, consumer products, and so on. And so the name of the game there really is uh, primarily is to get our, our big temple films uh, released in China. Uh, Fast and Furious uh, number seven is actually, to date, it's still the highest grossing U.S. movie in China with over $300 million in China alone. Why um, do you think it did so well there, by the You way? know, it, it's actually an interesting question. It's one that we've, we've asked a couple of different ways. I, I, I think it's just, um, I think it's, it's sort of agnostic. It's action. Uh, you know, it's really entertaining. Um, you know, I, I think it appeals to, it's sort of multi multi uh, cultural and uh, multi-gender, and so I think it just appeals to the broadest range of people. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. but um, you know, so anyway, China is very important to us. We we are also looking at opportunities to potentially co-produce with China. They they have an amazing production infrastructure there uh, of their own, and looking to see if there's ways that we can collaborate on local products and things like that. We don't see them as a threat. It's a, it's a, I think it's all great to add to our ecosystem of movie making. Do, do you have to make a lot of changes to films in order to show them in China? Not really. I'm, I, I think one of the biggest shifts, actually, where China is concerned over the last few years is um, the, the conversations actually start at the green light. So at the point at which we're ready to move forward on a film, particularly a big budgeted sort of spe uh, you know, spectacle action film, you know, the kind that we are hoping will get into China. Um, we talk a lot uh, at the green light table and we actually confer a lot with, with, our, with our partners in China. Uh, you know, certainly, first and foremost, to make sure that we're avoiding anything that could be, you know, considered offensive to that market. But, you know, looking to see if there are casting opportunities or location opportunities and things like that, that could make it potentially more appealing. Okay. And then we had Susan would just ski up here just yeah. a, a little while ago, obviously. Um, how are you thinking about the, the changing habits in terms of, you know, how, how younger people especially are consuming content? Um, at, at Universal? Well, there's a couple of different ways that we look at, um, you know, the new platforms that are available and the way that we see that consumers are, are, are looking at their content. And, um, you know, it's um, one of the tricky areas for us is, as Susan was saying quite rightly, is that, you know, young people in particular are really moving away from linear television. We were talking earlier about our children. I have a five and seven year old uh, sons they have no idea. I tried to explain to them one Sunday that Curious George was not on at five o'clock and they just couldn't understand what that meant. What do you mean? It's always on Netflix. Um, I told my girls to watch Saturday night, Saturday morning cartoons just a few weekends ago and they were like, yeah, what are they, Saturday they, they, they just, they they just don't get it. Um, but what that means to us is when it comes to marketing our films, you know, we, don't have, uh, we don't have the traditional, we're not capturing the, the, the eyeballs obviously with, with one of our you know, biggest sources of, of, uh, of marketing is, is on linear television. And so that's something that we're looking at. And we are actually turning our attention much more towards digital platforms for marketing. We, we actually released a film called Unfriended, which is one of our little micro-budget horror films. And 60% of our marketing dollars were spent on the digital platforms. Uh -huh. And that, I mean, that's a, that is usually about 12%, but that percentage is actually getting higher wow. every year. Um, and then the other way, the, you know, the other thing that we're looking at, I mean, you know, is, is just in the digital distribution, EST windowing and things like that, you know, and just, just making sure that we're, that, we're, that we're actually pushing those platforms. Again, I think we look at it, we, we obviously look, I will say I make, you know, we make content, I'm a content, you know, maker and I, that's what I love to do and I, and I am a firm believer in the theatrical experience. I mean, I know there's nothing more I love to do than go and see a movie in a dark theater and, you know, go and laugh along with 350 people or, you know, go and be wowed by great spectacle and great sound. But the reality is, and the consumer is ultimately gonna tell us that, you know, it is, you know, content is available, you know, anywhere, anyhow, and we have to be very mindful about that. So uh, another question for you, you, you are a woman uh, yes, and, and, and you are in Hollywood, and you've been in Hollywood for a while. Um, there's been a lot of scrutiny and, and discussion and, I think, healthy debate, for the most part, lately about diversity and inclusion in Hollywood, just like there has been in Silicon Valley and in other uh, industries. <coughs> Have things changed? Are they changing? What are you doing personally within your organization to change them? So, you know, I'm thrilled that this conversation, as you said, across many different sectors is reaching, um, you know, is reaching the sort of the heights and the levels that it is. You know, I found myself having, you know, many more conversations with many, many more just sort of different kinds of people about inclusion and diversity than I have ever before in my career. And I'm, you know, really encouraged by that. Um, the reality of it is, though, is that, you know, by speaking for the film business, is that the statistics have not really changed. The needle hasn't been moved at all in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And, um, you know, it's really, it is time now, I think, that we're going through a cycle, because I think that it is cyclical, but we are going through a cycle where we have captured people's attention to really take advantage of that.
Mm -hmm. um, you know, specifically for me, uh, you know, being a woman, I know what I like to go and see in a the movie theater, you know, so, so for me, green lighting a film like Fifty Shades of Grey, which, you know, you may like, like it or not like it, but it's a film that, that appeals mm -hmm. primarily to women, or Trainwreck last year with Amy Schumer, and taking a bet on somebody who, you know, hadn't had a, a film career to date, mm -hmm. Um, but recognizing that there's a real space in the marketplace for that. So definitely taking advantage of that. Um, we work with the AFI, with, an, with the Women's uh, Director Program. Mm -hmm. We work with the Sundance Institute on a great program that I love, um, which is uh, it, it's, a, it's supporting directors in their, in their second outing. So the idea behind it being that raising a couple of hundred thousand dollars to make your first movie, not easy, but you can get it done. And then after that, after you've done that, what then? Mm -hmm. You know, that second That's movie, the Out of the Gate, is sometimes much harder than, than the first one. And we were seeing, you know, Sundance Institute um, collaborates with uh, Annenberg and a number of other great research uh, uh, organizations. And they were finding that women were dropping off, uh, particularly female directors, would, would, they were kind of dropping off in their second, second movie window. So, supporting them and being able to bring the resources of the studio, financial and also expertise resources to take a group of people and support them in the endeavor of making the second Let one. me ask you real, real quick. Um, the Hollywood Reporter, they did away with their ranking on yeah. their women in entertainment list. I don't know if you all saw that. Do you think that was the right move? I mean, should we do that with our most powerful women list? Should we do away with ranking? Is it negative, positive, neutral? Um, I think that uh, you know, if I if I you know would paraphrase Janice Min at the at the breakfast last year, I, I think that she had been you know running it that way for a number of years, and she had got a little bit fed up with the politics behind it. I can't speak to that. I I don't know. I didn't really participate, mm -hmm. but you know, I think she just thought, well, you know what? I'd rather bring a group of you know really talented women together and and not put anyone under the burden of of having to be ranked. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I think uh, I think people being recognized and acknowledged for you know for for, for the for the things that they've done is a good is a good thing. All right. Well, we're we're all looking forward to Fast and Furious number eight. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Donna. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you.